He was present, sir. Uh, can you please take over the session? Can you please see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm, a, okay. I'm able to see. Right. One of the problems of uh, online education is what we have experienced just now. now technology is not uh, reacting to what we expect it to do. So I think part of the national song we lost and part of the introduction we lost. I hope uh, all of you are able to hear me. Yeah, Professor Sambashi Rao, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very okay. clear, sir. Now, a uh, small correction. I thought I would be uh, able to cover both the topics, NEP 2020 major highlights, as well as Education 5.0. But then when I started uh, compiling the information on uh, NEP, I found that it is uh, much too large for an hour or an hour and a half presentation. Therefore, Education 5.0, I, I have dropped. Uh, essentially, what it means is as education evolves from Education 1.0, where the teacher was the boss and the student was a passive uh, learner, to the current uh, developments which have taken place, including technology interventions and so on, and the learning outcomes, the accreditation requirements and so on. We have now moved over to Education 5.0. But anyway, uh, if there's another chance, I will speak about it. Okay, let me now concentrate on National Education Policy 2020. Now, Yes, this is an official document, NEP 2020. It is announced by the Ministry of Human Resource Development. It is no longer a Ministry of Human Resource Development, but according to the recommendation of uh, this policy, it is now Ministry of Education. It used to have Ministry of Education, subsequently converted to MHRD, but now it is back to Ministry of Education. It is an official document uh, announced by the Government of India. Uh, Ministry of Education. Now it has a vision. Let me close this. It it one second. Why isn't this going away? It has a vision. Uh, when a document has a vision, it means that it is a target for our attention all the time when we go through the implementation uh, of the uh, policy. So what does this uh, vision say? It says that the NEP, it says 2019 because the draft was produced in 2019, approved by the cabinet uh, in 2020. One second, let me clear this. Can you help me clear this uh, sector here? Sir? Is it too? I want you to clear. Sir, you can close that or you can minimize that. I'm trying to do that. Yes, sir, at this point of time, minimize. Right. Corner. 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 So the vision is, it is an India-centered education system. Every country has its own policy and uh, objectives and the implementation issues. Now, this is an India-centered education system where we might borrow ideas from other countries, but this is something very specific to our country. That is why our budget has to provide the for funding for achieving the recommendations of this policy. It contributes directly to transforming our nation sustainably into an equitable and vibrant knowledge society by providing a quality, high quality education to all. It addresses all the stakeholders and the country is uh, bound to fulfill the expectations of all the stakeholders and of all the sectors of uh, the country, including uh, science and uh, education and defense and so on. Now, if you look at the major transformational reforms which have taken place in our country in the education sector, 
since the time we got our independence in 1947, the first university education commission, it uh, worked uh, through 1948 to 49, and the secondary education commission from 52 to 53, education commission under Dr. D.S. Kothari, 64 to 66, it is very famous essentially because many of the recommendations made by this commission, Kothari commission, ultimately were implemented uh, in several areas, several sectors in our country. The national policy on education, the first one was uh, announced in 1968. And subsequently in 1976, the 42nd constitutional amendment was passed. It was an extremely important amendment essentially because till that time, education was only in the state's list. But subsequently, it is now in the current list, concurrent list, essentially meaning that both the national uh, government as well as the state governments, they both have accountability and responsibilities for the, uh, achieving the results of uh, the education policy. In 1986, uh, an NPE was announced followed uh, by a modified version of it in 1992, including a program of action. It is important to look at these milestones because we now know what were the intermediate steps that were gone through before we came up to the latest policy. T.S.R. Subramanian was the cabinet secretary at that time and under his uh, uh, leadership, a uh, report was uh, presented to the country in 2016 May. And the latest one, of course, is the Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan Committee, whose report was uh, uh, presented to the cabinet. It has not been approved by the cabinet. Now, the consultation process, because before a policy is announced and then taken up for implementation, almost all the stakeholders should be convinced that these are the desirable recommendations and if any midcourt corrections are required they would be made because when uh, we implement the policy there must be wholehearted participation of all the stakeholders in the implementation so several strategies were adopted this is the central government uh, online portal and it was pre um, put on this portal for uh, uh, nine months and comments were uh, solicited Similarly, 2.5 lakhs gram, gram panchayats, urban local bodies, they were also presented with this uh, draft document for their comments. The draft NEP 2019, the summary was uh, prepared in 22 languages. These are the, our uh, official languages. India has 22 official languages. And then education dialogue with MPs uh, from these states, special meetings of CABE, Central Advisory Board for Education which is the umbrella body for policy making. And it was presented also to the Parliamentary Standing Committee and uh, HRD in November 2019. Now, what are the major reforms in higher education proposed by this policy? It uh, sets as a target 50% growth enrollment ratio by 2035. At some point later, I'll point out what the current gross enrollment ratio is. It is approximately half of this. By 2035, in another 15 years, we are expected to reach a gross enrollment ratio of 50%. In many of the advanced economies and advanced countries, it is of the order of 80%, 90%, and so on. So we are way behind the gross enrollment ratio. And uh, the, to provide holistic and multidisciplinary education, which provides for flexibility of subjects, multiple entry, multiple exit uh, possibilities. That's an important uh, change. UG program either of three years or four years. I'll speak about this a little later on. PG program of one or two years. Integrated five-year bachelor's or master's. This already exists in many of the institutions. This is an important uh, recommendation. MPhil to be discontinued. It uh, at the moment exists in a number of institutions, but it will be discontinued uh, in a graded fashion, I suppose. Credit transfer and academic bank of credits possibilities will be explored. And uh, high, HEIs are higher education institutions. They are classified into research intensive and teaching intensive universities and autonomous degree granting colleges. Autonomous 
uh, one of the recommendations is that there will be no more any affiliated institutions in 15 years. All the institutions will be autonomous uh, colleges and many of them will be given the opportunity to grant degrees. Meru model multidisciplinary education and research university in or near every district. Graded autonomy, this has been proposed by UGC over the past few years and autonomy referring to academic, administrative and financial autonomy, phasing out the affiliation system in 15 years. There will be a national mission on mentoring, independent board of governors for every institution. It started with the IIMs, uh, which have the uh, responsibility and the possibility of uh, selecting their own directors, for instance. A single regulator for higher education, excluding legal and medical, AICT and UGC will be subsumed into this single regulator. The details we'll look at a little later on. Online self-disclosure based transparent system for approvals in place of inspections. Uh, it's a difficult thing to and transform, but it will be done. Common norms for public and private HEIs, uh, higher education institutions, private philanthropic partnership, fee fixation within broad regulatory framework. They, th th there are a few terms which are used in this policy that you will have to get used to. Also many new acronyms. The old acronyms will be dropped. For example, MHRD will be dropped, but new uh, acronyms uh, have been introduced. So fee fixation with uh, and a broad regulatory framework, public investment in the education sector to reach 6% of GDP at the earliest. This has been the objective over a large number of years, 30, 40 years, but even today it has not reached, even in the new budget, it has not reached 6%. A national research foundation, some details I'll speak about later, will be the nodal uh, agency for dispersing grants for planning research uh, objectives and so on. Internationalization of education. Those of you who have been following uh, the progress of uh, the education policy would have noticed that under an earlier government, this was resisted. No internationalization of education uh, for several reasons, but now this has been included as one of the desirable objectives and integration of vocational, teacher, and professional education under a broad umbrella. Setting up of new quality HEIs has been made easier. Standalone HEIs and professional education institutions will evolve into multidisciplinary institutions. Please note, it is, it will, uh, you will see this in a number of recommendations, multidisciplinary institutions. Uh, I won't... Uh, uh, say it now, but uh, later on you will see that no more technical universities, no more medical universities, etc. Special education zone for disadvantaged regions, geographically disadvantaged regions. National Institute for Pali, Persian, and Prakrit, a national educational technology forum, which is an important recommendation. And MHRD to be renamed, renamed as Ministry of Education. There are some fundamental principles which have been stated regarding the formulation of this policy. Ask yourself the question, what is the purpose of our education system? So it states that it is to develop good human beings capable of rational thought and action, possessing compassion and empathy, etc., which are in line with what has been stated in the Constitution. It aims at producing engaged, productive and contributing citizens for building an equitable, inclusive, and plural societies. And here is a good definition of a good educational institution. Again, ask yourself the question, what is a good educational institution? And here is the answer. It's an institution in which every student feels welcomed and cared for, where a safe and stimulating learning environment exists, where a wide range of learning experiences are offered, and where good physical infrastructure and appropriate resources conducive to learning are available to all students. So attaining these qualities must be the goal of every educational institution. So whenever you make plans for NRI Institute of Technology, remember that this is what is expected of a good institution. At the same time, there must be seamless integration and coordination across all institutions. 
Now they uh, say a lot of things about school education and even preschool education, but since our focus is on higher education, I look at quality universities and colleges, a new and forward looking vision for India's high, higher education system. Uh, higher education includes uh, technical education, general education, medical education, etc. So, so it covers all these areas. Higher education is important. Why is it important? Because it is what the pro uh, producers, the graduates for economic development, for social development and so on. And uh, this is to develop India as a, envisioned in its constitution, a democratic, just, socially conscious, cultured and humane nation upholding liberty, equality, fraternity and justice for all. They are all universal uh, uh, objectives of for all countries that we have combined together a number of them to introduce a comprehensive uh, uh, set of uh, uh, characteristics. Higher education contributes towards sustainable livelihoods and economic development of the nation. Again, those of you who have been following uh, the progress of uh, policies and so on, uh, realize that uh, there are question being asked is, is the basic education a public good or not? Is higher education a public good or private good? Private good basically means that it helps only those people who go through that uh, education and public good means it helps the community around you, a large number of people who interact with you. And India moves, move, is moving towards the knowledge economy and society. More and more young Indians are likely to aspire for high education. Again, you would have heard uh, this uh, knowledge economy uh, in, in earlier times where knowledge plays an important part and you have to, you can derive benefit from uh, the imparting of knowledge and the application of knowledge. So this is a, a term that has been used uh, considerably in the recent past. Now, they also have identified, as you know, the policy, uh, they had a basic team and the chairman was uh, Kasturi Rangan and they invited ideas from a large number of academics for a large number of people from industry and business. And they have uh, compiled all this information together and they have identified the major problems currently faced by higher education system in India. For example, in your own institution, you can identify many of these things which apply to your institution. A severely fragmented higher educational system, there is no seamless uh, uh, progress or continuity between the different uh, uh, subsystems, less emphasis on the development of cognit cognitive skills and learning outcomes. Again, this learning outcome or the graduate attributes, which is a term you would have come across uh, in the uh, NBA accreditation manual and uh, the self-assessment reports that you produce. It is just not memorization of existing knowledge, but then to uh, evolve uh, learning outcomes and achieve them. It's something that you must be used to, but here the focus is on that. This is another important thing. A rigid separation of disciplines, the existing issue with early specialization and streaming of students into narrow areas of study. From the first year, for example, if you make the student learn only about a specific branch of uh, engineering, then that is early specialization. Limited access, uh, but there are many socio-economically disadvantaged areas with few HEI that teach in local languages. Yesterday, for instance, the Prime Minister has said that in every state, there will be uh, at least uh, one uh, uh, university which, in which the courses will be delivered in the local languages. About Hindi, there is, it is a three language formula. We'll talk about it a little later. But then he was speaking in Assam. And he said that uh, there will be one uh, university at least which, in which the subjects will be uh, taught in local languages. How it will be done, that's a big challenge. Limited teacher and institutional autonomy. Uh, as I pointed out, most of our institutions, 80% of them are affiliated institutions and they, uh, and they have to uh, uh, act together along with other institutions in the same university. For example, the institution does not have autonomy, freedom to choose the subjects, freedom to appoint the faculty members, freedom to choose the uh, subjects to be taught and so on. So this is something that is being uh, uh, tackled. 
Therefore, you have a system in which there are many challenges. Therefore, you have to go to, uh, from the present system to a new system. You have to make changes to the current system. So what are these changes? Moving towards a higher education system consisting of large multidisciplinary universities and colleges. What do you mean by large? Large to the extent of in a university close to 20,000 to 30,000 students. If you take an IIT, for instance, we started with about 3,000 students, uh, including all disciplines. Now it is about 10,000 students uh, in each of the IITs, including also economics and uh, liberal arts and things with the degrees in liberal arts and so on. So these are large multidisciplinary universities. So IITs at the moment have about 10,000. The idea is these multidisciplinary universities uh, will have close to 20,000 to 30,000 students with at least one near every district. And uh, offering medium of instruction or programs in local and Indian languages. Again, this uh, term comes, uh, comes up all the time. Moving towards a more multidisciplinary undergraduate education, moving towards faculty and institutional autonomy, enhanced student experience to be provided, reaffirming the integrity of faculty and institutional leadership. Leadership and governance, very important uh, uh, features which uh, actually characterize institutions of excellence. I see that, uh, uh, no, I think one of your faculty members has gone to a QIP institution. But if you were a QIP institution, uh, you, um, I'm sorry, not QIP, TechWIP institution, you would have been given guidance on how to move towards better govern and higher quality institutions. We have produced a manual, uh, what we call the Green Book, uh, Good Governance Guide Guidance. So that kind of a recommendation is made in the policy. This is an important recommendation, establishment of a national research foundation to fund outstanding peer reviewed research. This will be the focal uh, point for university research and uh, non-university research, for example, CSAR labs, defense labs, and so on. Governance by HEIs by highly qualified independent boards. This is another term which appears uh, frequently in the document, light but tight regulation. We are single regulator for higher education. We'll look at the detail. Light by tight meaning that uh, there are few requirements would be proposed, but then all of them will be strictly reinforced. Not a whole lot of things to be achieved, but whatever as is proposed to be achieved will be done in a strictly enforced fashion. Increase access, equity, and inclusion, and uh, open and distance learning, as I pointed out, earlier it used to be looked down upon but at the moment it is given importance essentially because of uh, what we are doing in the presence of this pandemic now what does the transformed uh, regulatory system of higher education look uh, look like uh, this is important to follow the changes that have been proposed uh, a point is made that too much has been attempted to be regulated with too little effect i don't really understand that but uh, as I said, this is a group effort and they must have something in mind when I said this. And they point out that there are heavy concentrations of power within a few bodies and uh, conflicts of interest among these bodies and so on. Again, I've been a regulator, chairman of a regulatory body. I don't really understand exactly what is meant here. Anyway, you, you, so the regulatory system needs a complete overhaul. So in order to do this, they will ensure that there are four distinct functions of uh, your mic. There are four important functions, regulation, accreditation, funding, and academic standard setting. They will be performed by distinct independent and empowered bodies. Therefore, they have proposed four verticals and we will look at them and the umbrella institution will be the Higher Education Commission of India. Uh, what the UGC used to be, what the AICT used to be. Now, here is a larger umbrella organization, which is called the Higher Education Commission of India, the GCI, and it will have four verticals. What are these four verticals? The first one will be the National Higher Education Regulatory Council. 
uh, fully uh, made accountable for the regulation. This just carries out the function of regulation. It is NHERC. You will be coming across this uh, in more than one area. So excluding medical and legal education, the uh, regulation of all the other uh, agencies, multiple regulatory agencies, they will all be subsumed into the National Higher Education Regulatory Council of India. It will be a single point regulation. Again, they talk about light but tight uh, regulation. There's a grievance situation mechanism which is uh, proposed and also feedback mechanism. The second vertical will be the National Accreditation Council, NAC. It is not NAAC. This is a much larger agency than NAAC. It is the National Accreditation Council, and it is uh, what may be called a meta-accrediting body. So it will uh, be based on basic norms, public self-disclosure, etc. But again, overseen by NAC, not NAAC. All HEIs will uh, prepare institutional development plans, IDPs. If you have been a tech, are you, uh, have you been a tech, tech equip institution? I'm sure of. Have you been a technic, tech equip institution? No. Am I audible to all of you? We are no? not a uh, tech equip, sir. We, we are, are not tech equip, sir. Okay, fine. Yeah. If you were a tech yeah. institution, the first thing you would do is to prepare an institutional development plan. You specify for yourself over a specific time period, five years or 10 years, what you want to be and how to transform yourself from the present state to the desired state. So all HEIs now will present their institutional development plans to attain the highest level of accreditation over the next 15 years. And accreditation will no longer have the point systems that we have in NAC, for instance, or uh, in uh, NBA, you have uh, uh, different levels of accreditation, but then globally, there is only, it's a binary process, yes or no. And that, is, that will be followed in our uh, system also. The third, the first vertical is that covers the regulatory function, the second vertical will look at the accreditation function and the third vertical will be the Higher Education Grants Council, HEGC, will look at the funding and financing of higher education. The fourth vertical will be the General Educational Council, GEC, which will frame the expected learning outcomes for higher education programs. At the moment, we have a national skills qualifications framework. It has been developed over the past 10 years, uh, taking uh, lessons from or taking ideas from Australia, for instance, the UK, for instance, they have very well established skills qualifications framework for vocational education. Similarly, there will be a new national higher education qualification framework, an academic qualification framework, and the two of them will work in tandem to uh, cover the entire range of uh, uh, vocational and uh, higher education. Idea is to prepare well-rounded learners with 21st century skills. These 21st century skills have been uh, um, formulated uh, by many agencies, particularly, for example, the World uh, Economic Forum. And if you do a Google search and you'll find out what these competencies are. Now, what about the professional councils which we have for example, the Indian Council for Agricultural Research, Veterinary Council of India, National Council for Teacher Education, Council of Architecture, Pharmacy Council of India, and so on. They will be characterized as professional standard setting bodies. These are related to the different professions and what should be the minimum standards of the graduates coming out of, the, of these educational systems. So this will be uh, undertaken, they will be called professional standard setting bodies and they will have no regulatory role. Pharmacy Council, for instance, the Council of Architecture, they have their own regulatory requirements at the moment. They will be invited to the General Education Council, but they will have 
no regulatory uh, role. That's an important recommendation. So I've looked at the structure of uh, the new uh, system, including regulation, accreditation, funding, and so on. And uh, in India, education is non-profit, not for profit. By law, it is not for profit. There are countries in which there are both for profit and not for profit uh, uh, reasons. And for example, the US. In India, we have a lot of private institutions, but again, they are not expected to make any profit. They can have uh, excess of income over expenditure, which has to be reinvested into the education system, but for profit education is not permitted. So here again, there's an explicit uh, set of recommendations on how to curb commercialization of education. Those of you who are senior enough will remember that uh, in the earlier policies also, no capitation fees. Uh, this was one of the important recommendations, all really starting from not-for-profit uh, idea of education. So in order to do this, they will use both regulation as well as accreditation in order to ensure that uh, there is no commercialization of education. Like in TechWip, effective governance and leadership for higher education institutions is considered to be an important requirement. And uh, for this, graded accreditation and graded autonomy will be used as an incentive. And essentially because in all uh, world-class institutions, it is realized that if you want to create an institution of excellence, governance and leadership should uh, be an important activity that should be pursued. And the board of governors, how it should be established, what should be the responsible qualifications of the board members, the responsibilities of the board members and so on. If you had gone through TechWip, you would realize one of the most important uh, uh, duties of uh, uh, the board of governors is to uh, propose a strategic plan for the institution and hold the head of the institution responsible for achievement of the requirements of the strategic plan. Now, we are, we are an institution of uh, technology, part of professional education. So when talking about preparation of professionals, which you are doing, importance that's given to ethics and the importance of public purpose. Professional education for serving the needs of society for the needs of uh, the public, uh, the general public. So this will require not only in the education in the discipline, for example, education in computer science and engineering, and an education for practice, practice of the profession, not only theory, but also the application of this theory to serve the different professions. So they have looked at uh, the requirements and uh, make a very strong statement that professional education like engineering should not take place in the isolation of one specialty. That is, for example, a technical institution. Professional education becomes an integral part of the overall higher education system. So this is important. Standalone agricultural universities, legal universities, health science universities, technical universities, and standalone institution in other fields they will all be transformed into multidisciplinary institutions offering holistic and multidisciplinary education. Actually, uh, this is a very useful uh, transformation essentially because you need not only engineering, uh, those of us who are dealing with engineering is concerned, but then uh, embedded in a larger higher education institution, multidisciplinary uh, institution. So by 2030, they expect that all institutions offering professional or general education will aim to organically evolve into institutions or clusters offering seamlessly and in an integrated manner in large multidisciplinary universities by 2030, 10 years. Next, the online and digital education, and uh, also ensuring equitable use of technology because there is a huge technology divide a digital divide in uh, in our country, the rural areas versus the urban areas, where uh, the technology has not uh, uh, penetrated to the same extent, the same facilities are not available. 
So particularly because of the pandemic that we are going through and the changes which have already taken place. So the importance on online and digital education. I will uh, at the end of my talk give an opportunity for people to ask questions. Therefore, I will detail my talk uh, at a at the proper uh, stage. Talking about online teaching platform and tools, I am sure that uh, uh, there are two agencies, important agencies, which have come up uh, through the government of India. One is Swayam, as you know. I'm sure you are taking advantage of this Swayam. It is a Hindi acronym. It stands for, it, it is an acronym, Study Webs of Active Learning for young aspiring minds. So it's a massive uh, open online course platform. It's a MOOCs platform. In addition, they have a, a platform Diksha, which looks at the requirements of uh, teachers and it is teacher centered. Both of them will be expanded and distributed throughout the country and uh, helping the faculty members particularly. Addressing the digital divide, uh, remember about 30 years ago, ISRO had an experiment, SITE, Satellite Instructional Television uh, experiment, uh, system, where television was used even in rural areas in order to deliver education. At the moment, television, radio and community radio are expected to be utilized for uh, providing 24 by 7 uh, learning materials uh, right across the country. What about assessment and examinations? When you talk about teaching and learning, please don't forget that the third important uh, uh, feature of uh, education is assessment. So in order to do that, they're uh, talking about establishment of systems. One of them is PARAK, uh, which is an acronym for performance, assessment, review, and analysis for holistic development. Uh, and without assessment, you cannot have uh, certification. And therefore, assessment is extremely important. Another idea which is uh, uh, becoming important is blended models of learning. There have been debates and discussions on whether online is uh, better or superior to face-to-face -face instruction or physical uh, instruction in which the students and the faculty members are actually physically present. And the uh, agreement seems to be that blended models of learning there are aspects of learning for which the online is better, and there are other are necessary even, uh, and there are other aspects uh, which, for which a physical, uh, uh, like uh, Professor Samashero pointed out about uh, um, uh, laboratory instruction. How do you uh, uh, solve the issue of uh, laboratory instruction in online mode? There are remote experimentation, virtual experimentation, and uh, there are there need needs to be some areas where face to face instruction or physical presence is required laboratory instruction is one such uh, example and laying down standards uh, standards of content technology and pedagogy for online digital education so these are the details of what the policy has said about higher education and technical education including now, the most important aspect of uh, achieving the results of our policy is implementation or execution. How do we uh, execute the recommendations, implement the recommendations? It's a very important aspect. And uh, the government has uh, invested a great deal of thought and it has asked all the stakeholders to study closely how the implementation uh, strategies can be uh, put in place in order to achieve the objectives. The other thing is there's a strengthening the Central Advisory Board of Education, which is the apex body for all uh, types of education, school education, college education, uh, professional education, and so on. And the next issue is financing. Not only should the education be of high quality, but also it should be affordable. Otherwise, it will not penetrate through large uh, sectors of uh, population. So these are important aspects of policy as well as implementation. The, uh, according to the prime minister, when he released the 
policy, he pointed out, you know, he is a person who comes up with uh, uh, acronyms, with, comes up with uh, classifications of uh, recommendations and so on. He pointed out that the difference from the old education policy, what is new about the education policy which is being proposed, according to him, the new education policy focuses on how to think as opposed to what to think going being followed by previous education models in India. And he came up with some justifications. The new policy is research and technology focused. It talks about quality education. And uh, he remembered the APJ Abdul Kalam who said uh, that his dream was to provide education to make quality human beings. Swami Vivekananda has also mentioned this. So quality human beings, in the earlier discussion, I have looked at uh, what uh, features this, uh, these quality human beings must have. Again, according to him, teacher training is very important. And the cliche that he used was, when a teacher learns, the nation leads. Now you can uh, form your own uh, explanation of uh, this statement. And he also called upon institutions of uh, higher education to be uh, uh, leaders and uh, mentors for the other less uh, endowed uh, educational uh, institutions. Therefore, he requested the higher education institutes to conduct webinars, etc., for a successful implementation of uh, 2020. Again, if you remember, uh, when new institutions were set up, particularly IITs, the older institutions uh, held their hands and uh, they were acted as uh, mentors. And the uh, cliche word used was that they should adopt less endowed institutions. Uh, the, the better performing institutions to adopt uh, not so well performing institutions. Again, he pointed this out. Classes in mother tongue, at least until class five or preferably up to class eight, the student should be taught in mother tongue. There is a reason that uh, is explained in the policy document, and that is the brain development uh, occurs better if uh, the uh, uh, students, the learners are taught in their mother tongue. Multiple exit option, is also being provided, opportunities are provided. Germany, for instance, has uh, a very good system of uh, multiple exit, multiple entry uh, um, possibility. So you study for two years, half the course, then go out, gain some experience, and also probably earn some money, then come back and uh, rejoin the course for completing your degree program. So that possibility also will is, be, is expected to be proposed. Now I will go through some uh, more details, explicit details. Since uh, Dr. Kasudi Rangan was the chairman of the committee, the committee had about a dozen members. There was a very interesting interview of Kasudi Rangan by a couple of magazines. Mint was one of them. And clever and uh, smart interviewers, they asked questions of him to actually explore the reasons for many of the things that have been proposed. It's important. Uh, please look at the questions and also the responses. What were the main objectives of a revamp of the entire structure after 34 years? Because the previous uh, policy document was uh, prepared in uh, 34 years ago. So he points out that uh, we are going through a dynamic uh, set of uh, uh, environments and inputs and outputs. So policy document also, po policy must also be dynamic it basically means we move from the present to the future, a change which is uh, required, and, and, and that's what has been su suggested in order to come up with a better system than what we have. So uh, it has been said that we need to have an open-minded approach to education. So what does it mean? Can we explain? Uh, he says that the education cannot be in watertight compartments. A chartered accountant, for example, cannot just study finance. He has to study other things. That is why this multidisciplinarity is being proposed. So one of the critical characters is flexibility. Uh, possib many possibilities, integrated plus flexible. The major recommendation is to allow foreign universities to set up campuses in India. 
when the UPA government was in power, if you remember, there were a lot of discussions in the parliament, and ultimately the uh, decision was, and the, 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 the conclusion was that uh, foreign universities should not be allowed to set up campuses in India. Uh, so, at the moment, it's being uh, proposed. Will the powerful private college university lobby allow it to be implemented? I don't think it was a proper approach uh, for the question whether foreign universities should be allowed to do it. So the answer is, the response is, we're not talking about FDI in, from any foreign university. We are looking at the top 100. You know, there are two basic uh, ranking systems. One is the Times Higher Education and the other is the Quokarelli Simons or QS system. And uh, the top 100 from either of them or both of them put together. They're looking at top 100 and then invitation will be sent to them in order to set up uh, their branches or new institutions in India with uh, association with a local investor, for example, local educator, for instance. So the basic idea is to open our minds to excellence. We cannot and should not be close to such initiatives anymore. Therefore, whatever is best in the world, globally, you uh, borrow their practices, you Learn to learn to uh, emulate what they are doing in order to become excellent. Another important question: the number of seats in premier institutions like the IITs or the IIMs or the national law schools are too few for an aspirational country like India. So, if you expand them uh, and increase the number of seats, will it dilute quality? Uh, pertinent question. So he talks about the fact that uh, IITs should become multidisciplinary. Uh, let me point out uh, the next IIT director that already we have, they are multidisciplinary. We have economics, we have social uh, degrees in uh, social uh, sciences and uh, so on. The number of departments here, and I, in, I'll take uh, the IIT with the largest number of departments, IIT Kharagpur. It has as many departments and degree granting programs than any uh, broad-based university. Already has, you know, they have medicine in IIT Kharagpur. So he says you increase the number of seats, not by looking at the existing institutions and increasing the number of seats, but making them, restructuring them, making them multidisciplinary institutions. And therefore, if the number of seats will increase. The mother tongue issue or the local language issue. If you teach uh, our students even up to class 10 in the local language, won't Indian children be at a disadvantage in a globalized world due to lack of English? We have inherited uh, uh, English as a language of uh, medium, as medium of instruction. Should we give up uh, this advantage, for example, compared to China? China, they teach in the local language, but then if they have to globalize, then they add an extra language, English. So points out that the ability to grasp in mother tongue is more in the formative years of a child. Now, he resorts to the uh, idea of uh, English in a three language formula. Therefore, if that is uh, actually used, so it's, it's, it's actually deflecting the question, not answered it in a direct fashion because it's a highly sensitive issue. There are some states in India where the three language formula does not apply. It is only a two language formula, local language and English, no Hindi. Teachers are important in an education system. What does the NEP 2020 say about the teacher shortage and things like that? So he points out that the teacher education will be a part of the overall uh, uh, structure of the university system, there will be a separate department or a separate uh, uh, setup for opportunity uh, in the higher educational institutions for teacher training. In your own technical institute, for example, you will have a, a branch of uh, training teachers in engineering. And of course, this will be related to the national professional standards for teachers. All interesting questions. Rote learning and outdated evaluation seem to be the bane of our school and college education system, where our assessment systems, for example, promote uh, the uh, memorizing of uh, material and uh, the evaluation system also is in line with this. 
So the idea here is that uh, no longer will we have just only uh, formative, uh, no, the end of, end of uh, session, end of uh, semester examination, but you will also have continuous evaluation through the year. It has already been proposed by UGC, for instance. Therefore, this will prevent uh, the students from uh, g gathering uh, ability to memorize lessons, but to be able to think conceptually. What about research? How will we promote world-class research in our institutions and also that will benefit our society? He makes a damning statement that research in our universities is highly unsatisfactory. In fact, he says it is dismal. And if uh, we have uh, good researchers, they will also be good teachers. I point out that this is not always true. Boltzmann, Boltzmann equation you must be using in several uh, physics and thermodynamics courses. He was a great uh, scientist, physicist, but he was a very bad teacher. So it is not, doesn't uh, follow, but still in general for the majority of uh, teachers, if you're good in research, you'll also be a good teacher. So the establishment of the National Research Foundation will throw the focus back on research and hopefully we will uh, do better in research. I, I have a few more things to say before I close and ask uh, for questions because there's no point in going through all the material, uh, you know, not uh, stress on the important things. One of the architects of this plan was Dr. Manjul Bhargava. He is a mathematician and he's a Fields Medal winner. For those of you who have not heard of this Fields Medal, I'm sure all of you have heard about the Nobel Prizes. Nobel Prizes are for basic sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and even Peace Prize, there's a Peace Prize uh, and so on. Whereas in mathematics, there is no Nobel Prize. So instead of that, uh, the equivalent prize is the Fields medal and he's a Fields medal winner which basically uh, makes him an, a mathematician of excellence. So he took leave from Princeton University, he's an Indian but he works as a professor in Princeton, mm -hmm. took a year's leave and uh, helped uh, the uh, uh, committee to formulate a national education policy. Therefore some of the ideas in this policy are drawn from his uh, recommendations and his experiences. So talking about need for multidisciplinary education, also interdisciplinary creativity of the student to be promoted. There is a big difference between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. You Google and find out what the differences are. But essentially what it means is in multidisciplinary system, you bring together a large number of diverse disciplines to come up with a given set of recommendations. Interdisciplinary activity is essentially occurs between uh, identified disciplines, between standard disciplines, now, between, uh, for example, uh, science and technology, uh, interdisciplinarity applies. So talking about holistic education in the Indian uh, old system, where uh, he points out that studying the sciences through the arts and the arts through the sciences, I don't really understand that, but essentially he brings in Indian uh, uh, early systems of education. Now here is an important recommendation. The 21st century subjects, examples are artificial intelligence, machine learning, design thinking, holistic health, organic living, environmental education and global citizenship education. At the relevant stages and in multidisciplinary systems, you can introduce uh, these uh, ideas. Let me close this particular section with some of my own comments and then I'll take some questions and I'll leave this presentation with you. Uh, and those of you who want to learn more about things that I've spoken about can look at the other aspects. Let me quickly go through my own uh, comments about uh, what this NEP has said and what it should have said. What is the purpose of a national education policy? Why do we have to come up with these policies at uh, frequent intervals? It gives the nation an opportunity to review the past, what other people have thought about, how we have implemented the recommendations, what has been our experiences, what are the mid-course mid corrections that we want to propose, etc. To review the past and then the future 
environments are changing considerably, the import of technology, for instance, and the national aspirations. So you chart out a future, taking a look at the past and also looking at what we want to do in the future. So we can be employed to introduce new features and reforms, major changes. For example, the 1986 policy combined technical and management education, and that's the reason AICTE looks at both technology as well as management, and also in addition, other things, hotel management and so on. Uh, but uh, that was the impetus for uh, combining technical and management education. And you may or may not remember that uh, the, that policy served to create the AICTE. Before that, AICTE was only an advisory body. But after this policy, it became a statutory body. And the new accreditation system for quality assurance, NBA, for example, it was introduced only as a result of that uh, policy. The intent of NEB 2020, I will summarize again, to revamp the higher education system, to restructure the higher education system, to help create world-class multidisciplinary higher education systems across the country, increase the GER to at least 50% by 2035, and the guiding goals being access, equity, quality, affordability, and accountability. At the moment, we have uh, about 900 universities under UGC and 40,000 colleges. They will all be consolidated into 15,000 high quality multidisciplinary institutions of much larger size. The scale up will take place. These uh, new institutions will have up to 20,000 students. These will be classified into three types combining research and teaching in different proportions. Type one with primary focus on research, type two focusing on both research and teaching in different proportions, and type three focusing on teaching. Uh, I have some comments about these that no institution can only be a teaching institution, a teaching only institution. Teaching and research have complementary aspects to each other. Therefore, you have to combine the two. They talk about the case for liberal studies. Recommendation is, even in professional education, we should have up to 25% liberal education. Uh, I point out two things. One is, it is more important to introduce technology literacy into general education than liberal studies to the extent that they are talking about in professional education. As a rule, as you know, when you do the curriculum development, our engineering curricula incorporate about 15% liberal studies and they want it to be increased 25%. The argument from technologists like us, technology leaders like us is, there is so much to be taught, taught to our students in order to make them competent technologists that uh, 15 to 25 will remove uh, the, the focus on many technical subjects. Already we have 15% liberal studies. This includes engineering ethics, environmental science and technology, civics, constitution, sustainability, and so on. Therefore, instead of demanding that uh, professional education should in increase, enhance the amount of liberal studies, liberal studies, uh, let them introduce technology literacy. The, the transition that we are talking about, transformation, it, is a, it should not be a disruptive change. The policy should reflect continuity with change, otherwise it will destroy systems. The policy should include Indian cultural traditions and the harmonious integration of education and skill development. I spoke about uh, the national skill development uh, framework, similarly higher education framework, the two must work in tandem. The policy must combine national aspirations and regional interests. After all, uh, education and higher education are uh, subjects in the concurrent list. Both the state and the overall nation have equal responsibilities. We should look at the requirements of the future and futuristic student. And a program of action should be again uh, proposed in order to implement the recommendations. Uh, fortunately, I have a section on Im implementation issues and plans. I won't have time to deal with them. Fortunately, the government has uh, used several agencies in order to implement the recommendations. Uh, I'll mention one of them, the uh, 
startling of uh, uh, a university in every state to uh, offer programs in the local languages. So, so several committees have made recommendations. As I pointed out, our, our prime minister when speaking about uh, Assam, he, he mentioned that uh, uh, such an institution will uh, be introduced, will be started in every particular state. So a number of the proposals, they are being looked at from the point of view of implementation. The budget has also provided for opportunities for doing this. Because when you want to make changes, start new institutions, you need funds. And these funds are to be provided by the uh, parliament through the budget. And many provisions have been made. And I have some of the details, but I won't have time to deal with them. But on the other hand, I will uh, encourage you to ask me questions or make your own suggestions, discussions, and so on. So the next 10-15 uh, minutes, I will uh, throw open for your comments and questions. Somebody let me yeah. moderate uh, the questions yeah. if they have been asked in the chat box, uh, yeah. and then um, ask me to deal with specific issues. Yeah, uh, uh, dear participants, uh, kindly pose your uh, doubts or questions to the uh, person, uh, to the resource person, Professor Ramamurthy, sir. Sir, Professor Ramamurthy, sir. Yes. Sir, I myself, uh, I'm having a doubt, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, uh, regarding the higher education in regional languages, sir. Uh, yes. Do you, do you think that as a positive move or, uh, uh, or, a, uh, or a move which is not a progressive one? Not a? Not a progressive one. No, no, no. It is not that. You see, education has uh, several aspects. One of them is excellence and, uh, you know, contribution to economic development, global development, and so on. The other aspect is the population has specific uh, prior learning, prior uh, practices, and so on. So you, it is, if it has to be inclusive, then uh, this is a uh, normative approach. You have to deal with the entire population. That is the reason this is being proposed. So it is not a question of progressive or regressive. Uh, it is a need. Why do we have 22 official languages? Yes, that, that because yes. that is a fact of the population. So you yes. have to provide opportunities for them to participate in uh, the overall development. Yes. So, therefore, what is the answer to that? So you have to start developing course materials, teachers, and so on, who can teach in the local languages. Uh, when I studied uh, I, I, until SSLC, which we had, we had SSLC and then intermediate, up to SSLC, we studied science in uh, the, the local language. And subsequently, we moved over to the college system where we started, in fact, it was a difficult transition because uh, even for an asset, for instance, there is a local term, but then when you came to the university, you have to get used to the new terms. So it is possible. Many of us have done that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So in Hyderabad state, Nizam state, till 1956, sir, so the official language for medicine and engineering was Urdu, sir. So yes. people used to speak in Urdu language, but they excelled very well, sir. Hmm. Yeah, it is, uh, possible, it is possible, but you have to start making changes sometime or the other. In Tamil Nadu, for instance, uh, you might say that it is, uh, uh, you, you know, a, a kind of work which is uh, not productive. But there are a number of people whose entire job is to convert uh, textbooks in uh, English, for example, into uh, Tamil. And uh, the argument that they gave, which is not really all completely as a matter of it's not a very valid argument. So in France, Germany, in China, and so on, they uh, do technology in regional languages, the national languages. 
and then they participate in global uh, activities. So when they can do it, why can't we do it? But the point is that we have a tremendous advantage in uh, having been uh, taught uh, or um, science and technology in English because of uh, the English that we inherited from the British. So why do you want to give up this uh, advantage? Uh, yes, sir. there is a question from one of the participant, uh, Mr. Yes. Mohammed Yosef. He asks uh, whether industry is going to accept technical education students uh, who passed in local language. Uh, we were accepted uh, by industry when we uh, topped up our uh, regional language uh, education with uh, the English language education subsequently, and uh, in in fact, in some colleges, they tell me that uh, they teach uh, technology, the textbooks in English, they teach it through the vernacular because the students are not able to understand they came from a vernacular system. Ultimately, they are, uh, they may be, they may have to be retrained for a certain amount of time, but uh, I, th I think it is possible industry will accept. Same thing with the online education as well as the face to face instruction industry was reluctant to uh, take uh, graduates uh, who uh, had only uh, open and uh, distance learning uh, inputs but uh, at the moment it has become a necessity when you talk to your industry partners and so on ask them this question what will it take for students who have been taught in the vernacular medium uh, to uh, be absorbed into their industries. And they will tell you strategies for doing this. The training and placement officer, he should undertake this study. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Sir, I just want to add a point, sir. Please. So even myself, I studied in Telugu medium up to intermediate, sir. Mm. So when when I entered in engineering, so I used to understand, uh, I used to translate English words into Telugu language and I understand, I grasped the basics. Mm. So that's how I made up my career, sir. And understanding in local language is very faster than uh, in English. Mm. So once you know the concepts, your foundation is ready. Of course, language is one of the communication medium. So that can be learned separately. Once the foundation is strong, I think a, an individual can perform better, better than learning everything in English. That's my opinion. We have to make adjustments. Yes, sir. Sir, there is a question from uh, Mr. Sheikh Chand Basha. So yes. any new subject which is uh, in the 21st century re related to pharmacy? Uh, actually, <laughs> I do not know. Uh, and I, you know, there, you have several pharmacy institutions in uh, your state and in the neighborhood. They will be able to tell you about uh, the latest advances and uh, subjects. I'm not able to uh, tell you. Yes, sir. So there is one more question, sir, uh, from uh, A.M. Ibrahim Ansari. So there is the education uh, department and other research options in developed countries. Are we too going to open such research options for uh, education department, especially for teachers? So to provide right school education with the right experience. The suggestion uh, here is at the moment, where do teachers get trained? If it is general education, you have uh, uh, PhD and MA degrees, and for engineering education, uh, you know, you have TTTIs, uh, uh, essentially for diploma institutions, but they also at the moment train uh, engineering teachers. So the idea is instead of having standalone uh, technical teachers training institutions or te teacher colleges, they, they should be a part of the overall uh, university. They should, they, they should be within the same university in which technology is being taught. I think that's a good idea. 
yes sir yes sir so sir uh, can we uh, wind up the session sir can we conclude yeah. the session because the, the next speaker is ready yeah please please do, do that uh, yes sir thank you very much sir uh, thank you very much you explained very well about new education policy and education 5.0 so you said uh, the institutions have to transform a lot uh, to become uh, the multidisciplinary institutions where the teaching staff have to contribute a lot in the development of education in, and as well as the institutions so with that point i hope the participants um so they they work well for the for the institution and also for